disappearing from this earth. You know that verse? Psalm 12, verse 1. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear among the sons of men. Help, Lord, give me health. Not so that I can make more money, not so that I can see my great-grandchildren, so, so that I can be a godly testimony in this world. So heal me. I have full faith for that. For me, for my children, for anybody who names the name of the Lord, and say, Lord, heal this person so that this person can give all of themselves to you and can be poured out as a drink offering. <clears throat> There's a great need for that. I wanted to talk about one, um, we've been talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The immersion. The coming under the waterfall. You get covered with water, as we said, in one of two ways. Either by going underwater or by having a waterfall completely covering you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is no different than just an immersion where you are completely consumed by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and that we've talked about that and what it is and what it isn't. <clears throat> and we've talked about a lot of things about what it isn't. We don't need to have any feelings to know that the Holy Spirit has come to reside among us. We don't need to wait for the Lord to give us His Holy Spirit just like a child doesn't have to wait for evil fathers to give food when they're hungry. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? So it's a good thing that is given so freely. <clears throat> so we don't have to wait for His Holy Spirit to help us overcome sin. If you are struggling with any sin right now, if it's the sin of Adultery, as bad as that, or whatever it is, trying to kill somebody literally, all the way to a spirit of unforgiveness, or a spirit of complaining or murmuring against God, saying, God, why did you allow this to happen? To a spirit of jealousy or anger or lust, or whatever it is. The Holy Spirit has been freely given to you, and you have no excuse. You, have, you are under no excuse. You cannot blame God at all. Why you're still struggling with it. Zero percent of it is in God. The onus lies on us to receive His Holy Spirit. To humble ourselves so that we may receive grace. Not that the problem may be solved. We know in Paul's case, 2 Corinthians 12, what we heard. That the thorn of the flesh did not go away. But he had grace to bear it. <clears throat> grace so that he never had to sin. So if we are beset or struggling with any sin, let us not think it is because we asked God for the Holy Spirit and He was not given to us. And so that's why I have to keep waiting. And once the Holy Spirit is given, then I'll overcome sin. No, that's not true. So let us get that far away from our thinking. But I want to talk about one thing that happens when we are immersed in the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit I believe it's something separate from being born of the Spirit. We've talked about this. Being born of the Spirit is being given the seed within us in which we say, Lord, I want to follow you. But a baptism of fresh immersions is not something that happens once, it should happen over and over again. And it's an immersion that is primarily meant to speed up our journey towards Christ. We are born of the Spirit because God, when God deposits His Holy Spirit with us, He tells us, I want to make you like Christ. I want to, that's your destination. I want to make you like Christ. And He sets you on this journey to become like Christ. But then He says, you can walk on your two feet. Or I can baptize you in the Holy Spirit so that you get a horse. Or as I use a motorbike in which you can go further not so that you can go and show off that look how fast I'm going, like many people use the gifts of the Holy Spirit to do. The Holy Spirit has been given so that we can get closer to Christ on this journey. So we can speed up. And so when a person comes to the end of themselves and say, Lord, I'm walking at only two miles an hour towards you. I'm not trying to solve world hunger. I'm not trying to solve all these problems. I want to walk closer and closer to you and I'm not... I'm not happy at the speed at which I'm going. I'm crawling when I should be running. Then that cry is birthed out of us. 
saying, Lord, give me the Holy Spirit that I can run faster towards you so that I can reach my goal. The Holy Spirit is given and he baptizes us afresh with a greater love for him, with the greater power with which to run after him. That should be our increasing testimony that I'm running faster towards God than I did before because I'm being baptized afresh in His Holy Spirit. I used to be going five miles an hour, but now I'm going seven. I don't compare myself to somebody who's going 30, but give me time. I'm getting to 30. I used to be five, now I'm eight. Come back in a couple of years, I'll be 12. I won't beat myself up that I'm not going 50 or 100, but I'm increasing. That's if we start settling for 10 miles an hour then we'll start petering out we'll start coasting and then we don't have the grace that we need for the Holy Spirit to keep going God wants us to go faster and faster towards Him it's only for those who are not satisfied with the speed at which they're going right now towards God but one thing that I want to encourage all of you here which comes with the power of the Holy Spirit filling us is two things but I want to concentrate on one thing today which is the spirit of boldness God's Holy Spirit must make us bold and I want to clarify what that boldness means we've talked a little bit about coming up and speaking here. I want to make sure you guys understand what the boldness I'm talking about means but I want to show you that Peter we talked about Peter who was a man who was running away from Jesus before he was filled with the Holy Spirit, was denying Jesus even to a servant girl. But now you see him in Acts chapter 2. You can turn there if you want. Acts chapter 2, filled with the Holy Spirit, after the Holy Spirit has come upon him, where he says he takes his stand with the eleven. There's a, there's a point of unity that I want to make. That I'll probably make next time. But then he says he raised his voice and declared to him, this is a man who has been filled with the Holy Spirit and now they were locked up in a room for 10 days waiting for the Holy Spirit but once the Holy Spirit filled him he came out given the gifts but he then raised his voice and you watch his sermon and it's no easy sermon to be preaching he was indicting the people and he spoke a very powerful sermon it didn't take hours it took probably if you read it it probably takes just about five to ten minutes max but it was a powerful sermon because it had the power of the Holy Spirit spoken with a boldness that the result was that the 3,000 or so came to the Lord it is this spirit of boldness and then again if you go over to Acts chapter 4 verse 28 now after they had been threatened now what happens is Acts chapter 4 Verse 13 onwards, after they heal a lame man, he get, they get brought up to the Pharisees and they are threatened. And they said, don't speak about this man Jesus anymore. Verse 21, it says, when they had threatened them further, after the disciple Peter and John said to them boldly, look, in verse 19, whether it is right in the sight, that's you be the judge, but we cannot stop speaking what we've heard. There's a boldness there even to stand up against the religious leaders. Verse 21, they had been threatened further. Then they go, this in verse 24, and they raise their voices to God with one accord. Here again is that the point about unity. But then they pray to God, and then you see what they say in verse 29 of Acts chapter 4. And now, Lord, take note of their threats. Lord, pay attention to that, and not destroy them. No, what you do with them, it's up to them. But for us, you grant us confidence and boldness with which to speak your word and you'll extend our hands to heal to bring healing and for the signs of wonders to happen but you give us that confidence and that boldness it is not a human boldness it is not extrovertedness it is not the lack of nervousness to come up and stand here in the pulpit what is the Holy Spirit's boldness let me tell you what it's not it's not extrovertedness that makes people gregarious and able to talk very easily it's not a lack of nervousness to get up and stand up and speak 
I still get nervous in some settings to get up and speak. Even though to you it may come across as I'm speaking very naturally. It's not that. I've never felt like the Lord was saying, I'll take away all of that nervousness. It's just part of human nature and some people feel it more than others. I do believe if you keep doing it, it gets a little bit less. The butterflies in your stomach start flying in formation. You get to tell them where to go. They're not all over the place. You can synchronize them a little bit. They're still there. They never run away. They go away a little bit. But it's, that's not the boldness I'm talking about. It may be related to it, but that's not primarily it. I understand the great distance it can be for some of you to come up here, and especially now that there's a platform and things like that. And I don't want you to feel bad. I don't want you to feel condemned because you don't get up here and speak because you feel really nervous. I myself struggle with it. When I'm praying, I'm like, I still have to say, Lord, I want to pray freely as a child is praying to his father, not worried about whether other people are evaluating it, but it's a struggle and it's a fight. And I've been praying publicly for over 20 years. So, this is not a condemning word to say, look, if you're having that nervousness, that that means you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. No, but number one, ask Him to give you boldness. Ask Him. First of all, you've got to ask Him to make you bold. The disciples were bold. The people of God are bold. Now, let me define what boldness is. I'm going to try something different. Sharon, do you want to try and read 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7? Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. God has given us a spirit. Thank you. God has given us a spirit, the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you this. What is the opposite of the Holy Spirit? Say it's the evil spirit. Say it's the devil. But I want you to look at this verse. The spirit he has given us is the opposite of timidity. And timidity is not, as I said, standing up and speaking, but it's that spirit that makes you cower, that makes you shrivel up in a corner because you are afraid of a roaring lion. Because you're afraid of a roaring lion who has been defeated, whose claws has been declawed, has no teeth, is chained but who roars. The end result is many Christians become timid. Have you ever heard a lion roar? It's a magnificent sound and it will make you timid. Now, I want to ask you this. Have you heard the devil roar? It can be a whisper. He roars to where you're timid and you cower. And the Holy Spirit has been given to free you from all that fear of a roaring lion who has no power. And the power is the roar. But you know as good as I do that how powerful even a whisper of the devil can be to make me cower and be timid. And my mind can listen to those thoughts. But when I want to define boldness, which is the opposite of timidity, I don't go to the dictionary. I go to God's Word. Look at the life of Jesus. But God's Word tells me what the opposite of timidity is and what boldness is as defined by Jesus and by the word Bible. It's there, right there, of power and of love and of self-control. This is the Holy Spirit who has been given us. And this is the boldness that we have. We must pursue a boldness as described by the Bible. Which is a spirit of power. Power, not standing up and speaking. 
It says about Jesus that he spoke with that authority, with the power that all the religious people didn't have. They were speaking from the same Bible. They were using the same verses. But Jesus had an authority. He had that power. And the power for the new covenant Christian comes from an overcoming life. And an overcoming life comes from being broken and humble. Because that's who gets grace. Let me say that again. The power on which I stand up and speak, God is my witness, is not because I have an intellect. It is not because I have less butterflies than you in my stomach. I genuinely go to God week after week and say, Lord, am I being faithful to you? I don't have lots of messages that God gives me ahead of time. You know this. It's been a transformation for me. I say, Lord, I'm seeking you, but I don't want to speak my ideas. I want to speak your word. And sometimes I come here and I have nothing that he's given me. But I say, Lord, you, I've been faithful to you. Week in and week out. You've, I've been faithful to you. Now you speak to me. I've, you honor those who honor you. I've honored you where it matters in my private life. Now you give me a word. And he's been faithful to give me a word. Every time, again and again. It's because I really believe how I access the power of God. And it's not by thinking and spending hours and hours trying to create sermons. Been there. Done that. But there's a much better way, which is communing with God and speaking of what one experiences all week. Not against preparation. But I really believe that the power with which we can give words of comfort to other people comes from listening and communing to God. And by being humble before Him and receiving His grace in the circumstances of life, God gives me grace to overcome sin. And that becomes that power which is sufficient for me. Let me show you that verse in, before we come back to that. In 2 Timothy 1, Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4. This is a very important principle for us to understand how we can be useful to other people. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4. The Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples. We are trying to get up and speak with the tongue of a disciple so that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. But there's a condition that we read that comes right afterwards. If you are going to do that, so let's not claim it and say, okay, I'm going to do it as we heard. I can seek him with all my heart and I won't claim that verse won't be applying because I may hate reproof and I may hate knowledge and I might not have the fear of the Lord. In the same way, I can claim, Lord, give me the tongue of a disciple that I may know how to sustain the weary one. But day after day, and I don't want to put too much emphasis on the morning time versus some other time of day. That's not so important to me as he wakens me day after day to listen. It's the listening that makes you the speaker. It's the listening to God and that communion with God that equips you to have a tongue that, has a weary, that can give an encouraging word to a weary one. So for people who plan to get up and give more roughage going forward and share more prophetic words, the, the pathway to that is not by spending more time studying God's word. That's an important part of it. But it's living with God. Listening to Him day after day and say, God, speak to me. Awaken my ear to listen as a disciple. You get confidence from that. Then it's based on the confidence in God's Word that's saying, God, because I've been talking to you every day after day and trying to listen to what you're trying to tell me, it's that confidence with which I get up and speak here. It's the confidence that God gives me because he says, my son, you're walking with me in private. Based on that, you can say, without having this huge five-point sermon or 20-point sermon or three-point sermon, you can just speak. And it'll be a word of encouragement. Let that be confident. 
to people who may not have the gift of speaking. Let that be a word of confidence to those who feel that I don't have the same intellect some others do. It's not about intellect to speak God's word. Fishermen spoke God's word. Go read Peter and John. You'll t you see the profound things that uneducated fishermen spoke, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Don't blame yourself because you don't have intellects like some other people. Listen to him. Day after day, he gives you words. Those words are meant to be given to other people as well. That's that power, family of God, that I have experienced myself. It's the power and the authority that comes when somebody debates with me about this or that. I, I might be wrong on some doctrinal issues here and there, but I'll tell you something. It doesn't shake my confidence at the core of who I am with God because I say, I know what really matters. You don't know how I live my personal life. You don't know how my heart is towards God. You don't know how I judge myself all week. But as I do, God gives me that confidence. And it's because Jesus said, oh, look, I'm, I'm looking at the Father. I don't need to worry about what you say about what I'm doing. It's that confidence that comes not because we care nothing about other people or we're just saying, I don't care anything what, what other people think about me to the point of, being insensitive it's because I say Lord I'm looking constantly towards you you are my confidence and I encourage you family of God to have that Holy Spirit baptisms immersions in the Holy Spirit so that he takes you to the Father and keeps you get your eyes open to him that nothing else matters that nobody else matters and you listen to him and that we will listen to him and from that get words and it may be a one minute word it may be a one second uh, phrase a 10 second text message that I write but it's an encouraging word it comes from a life lived morning after morning day after day of listening to him we've talked a lot about love being rooted in ground of love remember we're talking about boldness we're talking about the, the opposite of timidity it's love it's this effusiveness of love that comes out of us because we are rooted and grounded in God's love as I've said, I want my eyes to reflect that I'm loved. Not that I love you. Honestly, that's human love. I want you to see that I'm so deeply loved by God. Because I'm not the source. <laughs> Me loving you is not going to get you the solution to your problem. You need to know the love of God. I want you to know how touched I am by the love of God that you'll be inspired to go to that same God and say, God, give me your love. That's what godly people inspire me with, how secure they are in the love of God. They're not trying to impress anybody. They're not trying to prove themselves to anybody. They're so secure. They are content with plenty or little. They've learned to be content with a lot and with a little. This is way it is with God the other door family of God this is the love that we must have it's after we love experience the love of God that we can love one another that we ourselves can love God and the third thing that is cons that is associated with boldness the third thing that's associated with boldness, first is love, sorry, first is power, second is love. Not many people think of self-control as power. As I said last week, we think of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be such that he will come and overpower us. So that I don't even feel like getting angry anymore. I just, I'm in a constant state of nirvana. That's what we subtly often think happens when the Holy Spirit baptizes us but we don't go to God's Word where God's Word says the opposite of timidity is the spirit that has power love and give you the ability to say no give you the ability to say no because it's still gonna come and hit you it's still gonna come at you temptations are gonna come at you but now you're gonna have self-control it's a fruit of the Spirit self-control are you growing in self-control? Are you growing in the fruit of the Spirit? Of self-control? Let us not be fall over the cliff 
so much in saying, I got to give God the glory for everything. He's so sovereign. He's everything. I can do nothing without him. To not recognizing that God is trying to give you, work something in you. He, and he wants to work it in you so that you can work it out. Work it out, family. Work out that self-control. Work out that ability to say no to that sin that's besetting you. It's part of the power and it's part of the boldness that the Holy Spirit gives you. To walk by that roaring lion that tells you you're no longer loved. It's a roaring lion. That roaring lion that tells you that this situation has no hope. Look that lion in the eye and say, I believe God's word. My Lord still loves me. None of my feelings tells me that I'm loved. But God's word says that he loves me. So roaring lion, you have no power over me. I'm going to walk right by you and you can't touch me. No weapon formed against me will prosper. On what? On the authority of God's word. So yes, that temptation that's got a control over you so that you're overcome by it and overpowered by it. God has set you free. Now walk in that freedom. Walk in that freedom with self-control. With power, with love, with self-control. There is an important need for Christians who are baptized in the Holy Spirit to embody self-control. Self-control. And I'm, the reason I'm stressing this is because those of us who believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit tend to minimize the importance of self-control. We don't put the two together. Just think about it. Think about how you use to think about this word baptism of the Holy Spirit and this powerful God Himself coming and living with us. And we're saying, wait, part of that spirit includes my ability to say no? Yes, it's your ability to say no, not his ability to just make you avoid temptation. And it is that boldness that God wants us to have, not standing up in here necessarily, but first in your private life, having power, love, and self-control. This is how you know you're filled with the Holy Spirit, day in, day out. Now, like with everything else, as I said, Discard feelings and go with God's word. If God's word says it is so, it is so. There are days that I might not feel particularly that I'm born again or that I'm seated in the heavenlies, but God's word says that my place is there. That my, hand, my, my name is written on his palms. I don't feel like that most days. But I believe it based on God's word. Same with the filling of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We are filled with the Holy Spirit when we have power to overcome sin. Love, love, growing of God's love. And two areas in which this boldness happens, the way we see Peter having this boldness. It's very important that we have a boldness in the right areas. First of all, first of all, before we have boldness against non-Christians, very important. This is a difference between the old covenant who fought against the Philistines and the Assyrians and all those people out there to the new covenant where judgment is, a, is starts in the house of God. 1 Peter 4.17 Judgment belongs, begins in the house of God. The new covenant, new agreement, this new church is a church where we judge ourselves first before we judge other people. So important that we remember this fundamental principle of the new covenant that God's first word of indictment is against the Christian religion that tends to make our life about rules and regulations and laws. He put to death all of those rules and regulations for a life. And it's close within all of us that our Christian life begins and ends with a set of rules. I didn't do this. I did do this. I didn't do this. I did do this. And that's my Christian life. And it's going well or it's not going so well. It's not a growing knowing of God. 
It's not a growing pursuit of, Lord, I want to get to know you more. Track record, a no good track record, a bad track record. I want to get to know you more. My, my goal is wrong. And God wants that, what Peter spoke out against the Pharisees in Acts chapter 3 and 4. When he spoke out against it, we need to speak out against that religious system that dwells in us. And that is among us, that old covenant, that old wine that brings comfort to people. But God says, I've got to throw out this old wine. And you've got to get used to this new life, this new wine. That may seem different at first. That may not taste quite the same as the old, the comfort of the old wine did. But God's throwing out the old wine and giving you a new. It's a boldness against the religious system that opposes a life with God. Just ask yourself this coming week, am I living with God? I heard a man who just recently passed away, Dallas Willard, he just passed away earlier this year. Something he said really blessed me. He said how he tried to live his daily life was, he said, I tried to set the Lord before me. I, s I tried to set the Lord at my right hand. It was a beautiful picture for me. Through all the situations in life, he's like, I, sometimes I'm able to study the Bible in the morning, sometimes I can't. But I always try to set the Lord before me. Can you say that? Did you set the Lord before you, he was close by. That's what I'm talking about, rules and regulations. You don't need to set the Lord by because you got it all here. You know, I didn't commit adultery, I didn't look at that woman in lust, I didn't get angry, so it was a good day. Did you set the Lord before you? Did you check in with him often? Did you talk to him? You open your ears saying, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? It's that simple. But it's a life. And you'll start to dis be disgusted by the old wine of rules and regulations and regimen and this and that. And say, Lord, I want to talk to you. I just want you to be my friend. I want us to be friends. I want us to be closer and closer friends. Setting the Lord before you. And then we go to be with our friend when we die. It's not a bad thing. It's a beautiful thing. For me, for me to live as Christ to die is... Even better, you to be with him fully and to be known. Boldness, family, boldness, power, love, self-control against a religious life. Second one, boldness against this world system. There's a world system that is against us too that's on the outside and we have to be bold against it. So we're not afraid if we face persecution, we're not afraid if we face ridicule and all of that. God speaks a lot about that. Jesus speaks a lot about that. But I want to give you one picture about being bold against the world system. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. I was thinking, who was the first bold man ever to live on this earth? First bold man. And I thought of Noah. He was bold. And, you know, we have a boldness because in verse 4, God did not spare the angels when they sinned. There's a pretty serious judgment for sin. And cast them into hell. If anybody says, hey, look, I mean, why do you preach so much against sin? Maybe just kind of look at verse 4. See what happened to people who sinned. He committed them to the pits of darkness reserved for judgment. And did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, verse 5. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. But preserved Noah, and here's a phrase I want to underline. A preacher of righteousness. He was the first, as far as I know, man in the Bible who was bold against sin and against the world system. And he's called by the Holy Spirit, working through Peter, a preacher of righteousness. So... Those of us who want to preach God's word, it is good for us to study Noah's sermon. And who want to preach against this world system. Let me repeat what I just said. If you want to preach against this world system, you should look at Noah. He was the first person who stood up against a pretty bad world system. So bad that God said, I'm just done with this whole earth. But it says that Noah found favor with God and it said that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Have you ever read Noah's sermon? 
Who knows where it is? Anybody know where Noah's sermon is? Where is it? Bible scholars. You know what his sermon was, right? He built an ark. How many words? Zero. Built an ark. Called a preacher. It's the Holy Spirit speaking. It's through Peter, Second Peter chapter 2, called him a preacher. What did he do? He built an ark. Foolishness. On dry land, building a ship foolishness to this world but he built an ark because in Genesis chapter 6 or 7 he said God said build an ark not many people in this ark only eight not a big church small church built an ark two of every animal I look at it as maybe two of every culture one culture, but just a few. That's it. But he built the ark and he never cared to have to go and stand on street corners and doing all that. I'm not against it. I'm not against it. But I'm, I'm talking about boldness here. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit makes you bold. And this preacher of righteousness asks you to build an ark. Don't curse the darkness, light a candle. And the candle that God is setting on this earth is a lampstand. You know that? Revelation chapter 1, God says, Speak. And he saw the seven gold lampstands. Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, the seven golden lampstands with the seven churches. That is the light. That comes that's basically your local church that is what is your message you got to preach that is that lampstand that is that ark that we ought to build and we leave the flood the time of the flood we leave how people receive the light or whatever it is up to God but our directions are clear build the ark Boldness against this world system. I'm not activating against Congress. I'm not agitating in the public square. I'm not against people who do that. Let God give some people the desire to do that. Let them don't do that. As far as I'm concerned, when I look at God's word primarily, I see that the primary work of Jesus and the apostles, especially the apostles who lived after the Jesus, was to build a church. Build the ark that's a safe place for God's people family of God we've talked about hearing God's word for what is the right church be a part of a local church that's a safe haven and which is a preacher of righteousness that is preaching it by the way we live that we hate sin that we love righteousness that we are growing in the gifts of the Holy Spirit we're growing in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we're able to be a brighter and brighter light because we're walking in greater purity in our personal lives. Build the ark family of God. Be a preacher. Every one of you are called to be preachers of righteousness like Noah. Be a part of that ark that God is trying to build. I really believe that's the local church that the Holy Spirit is trying to give you that boldness to do. So when we ask you to come up and speak, we're not trying to evaluate you to impress, how impressive are you, or so that you can get an amen, or so that you can get an email from the elder saying that really touched me, or anything like that. It's not the reason why you should get up and speak. It's you, you, you get up and do whatever you feel you need to do to build the ark. You build the ark because of what God has done for you. God's, God's calling you to say, hey, look, this ark is going to be your way out. It's going to be this place of safety. Build it. If 
you believe what I'm saying, I have one question for you. Where's your hammer? Where's the nail? You got, you got something in your hand? So I'm going to help? Those are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. God gives you gifts of the Holy Spirit to help you build this ark. You can't do it on your own. Let's not have a committee now and say, now let's figure out how to build this ark now using NCCF. It's not the solution. We need to go to the Holy Spirit and say, give me gifts. Give me something. I need a hammer and a nail. I'm here with nothing. He wants to give you gifts of the Holy Spirit to build the ark. And we can talk more about that, about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But it starts with recognizing that the preacher of righteousness, we need to be preachers of righteousness, that we are like Noah's. We want to be bold. We need to have a hammer and a nail. So we say, Lord, I want to build the ark. I hope that this will start to sink in, that the priority of the body of Christ, the priority of the local church, the priority of the ark, I'm using the same expression, different analogies, different pictures, the ark, the body of Christ, the local church, you will be a part of it. Not all standing up here and teaching, giving the meat, but doing your part, praying for it in secret during the week, seeking to help other people who may be in need, giving a word of encouragement, seeking to have a word of encouragement by listening to God all day. Every single person here who names the name of Jesus and who surrendered their life to Him must build the ark. You must play a part. There's no room for people who just want to sit and attend. There's only one kind of people in the building of the ark, which is people who build the ark. If you don't have a hammer and a nail, that's when you need to have ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, give me a hammer and a nail. And you may have to wait for that. God may say, look, I, I know you want the hammer and the nail to heal people. Maybe it'll never be given to you. But you ask Him, you want to build the ark. That's the secret. That's the source out of which the gifts of the Holy Spirit have been given. And we'll talk more about that next week. Let's take a moment and uh, reflect on what we've heard. The thing that's... Um, the thing that's really standing out to me is this remembering that the pathway to being helpful in the church we, we know in Ephesians 4 we've mentioned this verse many times we're to grow up in all aspects into him that who is the head even Christ from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love is that a longing of yours do you feel that desire to be part of the proper working of each individual part. It's a longing of mine, for sure. We've heard about that a lot, I, and I, I really appreciate the reminder that the, path, the pathway to being helpful in the body is this daily discipleship, daily listening, inclining our ear as a disciple, that verse from Isaiah 50. It reminded me of a, um, a story that I read in Chronicle, Second Chronicles this week. Um, Second Chronicles 30, at the end of it, you don't have to turn there if you just want to listen. It just says, at the end of there's there's this um, restoration. Hezekiah ushers in this res restoration of uh, worship and Passover and um, temple worship. And at the end of all of it, it says, there was great joy in Jerusalem because there was nothing like this in Jerusalem since the days of Solomon, the son of, the son of David, king of Israel. There's nothing like this. This time of great restoration and revival. And the thing that came to my mind... Um, uh, is in chapter 29, in Second Chronicles 29, it says, there's this amazing, Hezekiah is restoring this worship. He's calling all the people to, to bring their animals and things like that. And then it says in verse 34, but the priests were too few, so they were unable to skin all the burnt offerings. Think about that. So many burnt offerings are coming, there's not enough priests to actually do it. Um, the priests were too few, so they were unable to skin all the burnt offerings. Therefore, their brothers, the Levites, helped them until the work was completed, until the other priests had consecrated themselves. And this is the verse that stood out to me. Because the Levites were more conscientious to consecrate themselves than the priests. The Levites were more conscientious to consecrate themselves than the priests. It made me think, what's the pathway, again, the same message, the pathway to being useful to the body in the time of need, in the time, it says later, 
Verse 36, Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced over what God had prepared for the people because the thing came about so suddenly. We never know when God's going to call us to do something or when he's going to raise the standard for us. But the, the key to our church being able to do that is, this, is the path of the Levites, not the priests. The Levites were more conscientious to consecrate themselves than the priests. So if you're wondering what's the small part you can play, if you're wondering what's the, the little bit that you can contribute in building up of this body, holding together by every joint supplying something, by each part working properly, this, it's so serious that we are conscientious to consecrate ourselves every single day, that we walk, wake up every day and say, Lord, not, not what's the message that you'd have that, for me to say to someone else, but Lord, what do you want to teach me so that I can be a disciple, that I can walk humbly before you, pleasing you? So let's take a moment now and just pray. Reflect on what we, the things we've heard today. Father, we ask you right now to illuminate to us whatever you want each of us individually to take from this service, that you'd be glorified in our church, and that you'd be glorified in our individual lives and in our homes, that you'd find us ready, capable, able to be used in whatever way you deem appropriate. Father, as you shine your light into our hearts, I pray that you would give us a, a, sensitive, a sensitivity, a real tenderness to your voice, that we would be eager to repent, we'd be eager to respond, that we would take your reproof, your correction seriously, that any time you stretch out your hand, we would be watching and anticipating and eager to play a part, whatever part you'd want, Lord, that you'd give us wisdom from above, that you'd give us discernment that we'd be able to discern your voice amidst all the other voices and that we would know how to be pleasing to you. Lord, please do it by the work of your Spirit. We know we can't do it on our own. And so we ask you for your help, for your guidance. Equip each of us that we might contribute something so that this body would continue to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, and even Jesus Christ himself. And that this body would be fitted and held together and growing to maturity by that which every member supplies. Lord, please press it upon our hearts, your desire to see each of us play a part. Please press it upon our hearts. We take our walk with you seriously each day that we would be conscientious to consecrate ourselves. That we would incline our ear towards your words. That we would listen and obey and respond to every single leading that we hear from you wouldn't seek to justify ourselves, but that we'd humble ourselves before you. Look to you for your help, your grace. Father, we thank you for being with us today, for the time that we've had together. We pray that, you, that your name would be honored here. We want for you to receive all the glory in our church and in our lives. And so we ask you to continue to lead us, uh, keep our faces low, keep your name uh, lifted high love you, and uh, we pray all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay, so announcements. Let's see. Uh, next week, next week we're going to start uh, the kids' time, so 9.30 to 10 when we're, when we're praying in here. Um, kids' time we're going to start in, I think, in the quiet room, we'll, and we'll do that from 9.30 to 10. So for kids who are school age who, who um, have otherwise been hanging out in here, we'll have time.